Hello and welcome to IAPMD's first ever podcast. Today we are joined by Karen Eckberg, Chief Operating Officer from Asarina Pharma. IAPMD is an international not-for-profit organisation that aims to inspire hope and end suffering for those affected by PMDD and PME through peer support, education, research and advocacy. Today we are joined by Karen, who is from Asarina Pharma. They are the developers of Sopranolone, the first PMDD-specific treatment developed in the world. Sopranolone has been many years in the making by the team over in Sweden. Clinical trials for this treatment were held in four countries across the world, the UK, Sweden, Poland and Germany. Recent results from the Stage 2B clinical trials drew a halt to any further development for Sopranolone as a treatment for PMDD. This was due to an unexpectedly large placebo response in the last set of clinical trials. However, this medication will continue to be developed as a treatment for menstrual migraines and Tourette's syndromes. We're delighted to be welcomed today by Karen, who is joining us from Stockholm, and she is going to answer some patient questions we had around these, the release of this top level data. Please note that a lot of the scientific analysis of the results is still to be done and will take a little bit of time and Asarina Farmer will join us again in due course for a more scientific deep dive into the results. So Karen, thank you for joining us today. It's very much appreciated by us all here at IAPMD. Um, I'm going to read out some questions that we have received from patients about the recent results. If you can just start by telling us a little bit about sopranolone, um, how long it was in development and how it actually acted on the part of the brain that causes PMDD. Well, thank you very much, first of all, to, for inviting me to this Q&A session. Well, the idea to use sopranolone for the treatment uh, of PMDD is based on research from the University of Umeå and Professor Torbjörn Beckström and his group. And uh, Professor Beckstrom, he's specialized in obstetrics and gynecology, and uh, he has spent 40 years to study how our sex and stress hormone actually influences our brain. Uh, and early, he got a special interest in understanding why some women suffer more for premenstrual symptoms than others. And uh, he and his group have shown that women with PMDD have an altered sensitivity to the action of some steroids. And one of them um, is called uh, the allopregnanolone, um, which is a degradation product uh, or sub substance from progesterone. And in the end of the 1990s, he discovered that he can inhibit the action of this allopregnanolone by its sister molecule. It's called isoallopregnanolone, and that is actually what we today call sopranolone. So they studied um, different subtypes of the GABA-A receptor on cells, and specifically those from the emotional center of the brain, and how allopregnanolone and then sopranolone acted on these receptors. They also did behavior studies in rats and eventually also uh, clinical data in healthy women to start with. So this has been a long development. Can you tell us please how many rounds of the clinical trials there were and how many people were in each set of trials? Um, and also how were those people um, selected? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, Professor Baxter and many other researchers have spent decades to, to do studies to better understand uh, premenstrual symptoms and the impact on them in PMDD. Um, and, um, and then, uh, um, Professor Beckstrom and team, of course, they uh, started studies to evaluate what allopregnanolone did in this, in this condition. But after the discovery of sopranolone, which was in the end of 1990s, uh, they did studies uh, on non-clinical studies first, of course, but then the first studies in, with sopranolone in women were basically first how to dose it. So these studies were done in healthy women, of course, um, and then they also did a effect study where they looked at allopregnanol-induced effects in the brain and used uh, how much sopranolone was needed to inhibit that. And that was done in, less, I think it was 12 of healthy women. So it was sort of crossover design. But then in 2006, uh, the company Azarina Form, Pharma was formed. Um, and the first years, of course, we spent on the drug development and how, how to administrate this. And uh, 
as you know, sopranolone is not suitable for oral administration because it's very avidly metabolized by the liver. So very little comes out uh, into the circulation if you take a tablet or, or a capsule with it. Uh, and in the beginning, we were actually trying to develop a vaginal administration for sopranolone, but it wasn't satisfactory. So these were all small studies. But then eventually we came around with the, uh, the uh, sopranolone injection product that we have been using now in a phase 2A and now this phase 2B study. So in total, 300 women with PMDD have participated. The first study was only in Sweden. Um, and the patients have basically or mainly been recruited via advertisements. Um, most recently, of course, a lot of social media contacts have been verified by the diaries, uh, the e-diaries, where, where subjects have entered their symptoms in smartphone. I'm just going to um, pull up one other question that someone asked on Instagram earlier. Mm. Okay, so someone on Instagram asked, I'd like to know what the difference of administration was between the last phase study and this one. I know for this one, it was an injection. So has it always been in injection forms with the clinical trials? Okay, yes. Well, for the studies performed in PMDD patients, yes, it has been an injection. The difference was that in the first study, um, we didn't have a good placebo and the placebo needs to have the same resemblance as the active. So actually the, the women had to come to the clinic to get the injections by specific nurses. So they came in every second day uh, during the, the second half of the menstrual cycle. Uh, but in the study that we just completed, uh, the drug product tested was filled in small, small syringes uh, with the needle already on, so very easy to use, and they uh, took the doses at home. So uh, every every second day, about seven injections per menstrual cycle. So okay. of course, that's the difference, I would say. Has there been any other high placebo outcomes in other injectable trials? just generally not sopranolone, but in general clinical trials? Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, I would say it's quite well known that when, when you have an injectable drug product, the placebo effect is higher because we sort of think that this is, I mean, this is a really potent drug, yes, because it, it's in an in injection. Um, so, so I think that is a perception that we have in general. The placebo effect was so high, what kind of results from the placebo would have been required to move forward? And yeah. someone separately asked, and uh, my biggest question is why they think the results came out this way. Does it mean that PNDD is all in our heads? Um, what does no significant difference usually indicate in medical trials? Mm. And what other so, trials will come up as to why? Sorry, very long question there. <laughs> uh, maybe we can divide it in three. Yeah, countries. sure. Yeah. A number of clinical trials in PMDD, first with a few serotonergic antidepressants and then also with the oral contraceptive or JAWS. And in all these studies, the placebo effect have been quite high. Uh, and that is sort of similar as in studies in, for example, depression overall, I would say. In the, our first study with Seprenolone that we performed in Sweden, uh, there was also a placebo effect. Uh, similar to seen before, but uh, the effect was not as pronounced as we had in this study. So why is it that we had such a high effect? Well, I can only speculate. One, one is, I think, related to the fact that we have an injectable medication. Uh, and in this case, the, these injections were taken by the patients at home. So I mean, it's conceivable that women volunteering and being willing to participate in such a rather experimental study uh, really are the big believers, of course, I would, uh, and feeling, of course, I've, I've, I've brave enough to do this. Um, and then also, of course, I think that in a condition where there is not such a good treatment alternatives, the expectation of a new drug specifically developed for PMDD is, of course, very high. Uh, and I think that contributes to the placebo effect. 
probably also in, especially maybe I would say in Germany and Poland, where patients have been even less acknowledged by the healthcare systems, taking part in the study and being seen and, and, and um, taken seriously is also, I think, contributing to the placebo effect in general, I must say. Mm-hmm. So that validation of being listened to. Mm. I think so. Finally, yes. I think we can definitely understand that as patients. I'm sure I know I've had the same myself. I lived with PMDD for many years. Mm. The biggest question of why these results came out this way, does this mean PMDD is all in our heads? I have no doubt that these premenstrual symptoms are not real, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. However, when we develop a new treatment, we have a demand to focus on a pure condition. And uh, in this case, the challenge has been not to include patients that, or women with under underlying conditions that just exacerbate because they also have a PMS. Um, don't take me wrong. Of course, these women also need, need um, uh, and may benefit from an efficacious treatment. But in, in such a research, I think uh, we, we have to focus, and that's also expected by the regulatory agencies for an approval. Uh, I think the study results we have seen so far in the study, I don't have all data yet, but taken together with previous results, the results here is not proving that sepranolone does not have a beneficial effect. But we have to remember that the PMD diagnosis, even if it's very strict, it is a symptomatic diagnosis. And it may well be that not everyone participating in the study have the same underlying reason. So I'm pretty sure and convinced that there is a substantial group of women with severe premenstrual symptoms that is caused by this altered sensitivity of allopregnanolone, and those would indeed benefit from a treatment with sopranolone. But there may also be other reasons for the condition, of course, and those we might not be able to treat. This is also a reason why we re, there is a request for us to have a sort of pure patient population. Um, what other trials will come out like this and why? And someone asked, what does no significant difference mean? Mm. Um, what does that usually indicate in medical trials? Mm. So, well, uh, to obtain an approval for a new drug, which this is, although it's endogenous or, you know, natural, it's still never been used as a drug. So for the regulatory agencies, uh, it is a requirement to demonstrate there is a a pharmacological effect of of the drug on top of placebo. And uh, this needs to be proven by what we call the statistical significance difference between the active and the placebo group. So it's it's a sort of... um, they, they don't tell us right now what size it needs to be in the difference. It just needs to be uh, statistically verified that it is a, a probability of the result to be true is uh, sufficient. That is what it means. Uh, what exactly was in the placebo? Someone has asked, was it sugar water, vitamins or plain water? What mm-hmm. exactly was in that placebo that the control group was given? Yeah, the- the placebo was basically uh, water, if we say, but containing a little bit of fully natural fat, harmless fat, to make its appearance to be similar to the sopranol injections because they are a bit white and milky. So this is what the placebo was. In the early clinical trials, um, it showed there was an improvement. So why don't you keep developing sopranolone as a PMDD treatment? And also, could sopranolone still be used in treating PMDD off-label once it is developed and um, hopefully out there as a treatment for menstrual migraines and Tourette's? Mm. Well, Azarina Pharma is actually quite a small company, first of all. And, um, and we are... are right now in parallel running the study in in a parallel condition um, which is migraine Um, that is particularly for women that have migraine appearing before and during menstruation and we believe that this is also due to an altered sensitivity of allopregnanolone it's just presenting itself differently from the premenstrual symptoms Um, and uh, um, 
So it's the very same drug product that we're using. And of, if we are successful with that development of the suprenal injections, they will be, and they will be available on the market. Well, uh, of course, off-label use can, can occur. Uh, it's a matter of cost, perhaps, and, and pricing. But more importantly, of course, the, these um, injections will be available for further studies in PMD. So I think that's the best hope. Because, um, I mean, for a pharma company, not for a Serena Pharma company, any bigger one, we, are not, um, we cannot uh, provide a not approved drug. To patients. There are rare cases of something called compassionate use, and that is when a, a doctor can apply for a given per patient uh, a drug that is not yet approved. But the prerequisite is, of course, then that the pharma company then have a supply of the drug available, and that is not as easy as it perhaps sounds, unfortunately. So we as a company or any other pharma cannot cannot suggest off-label use. It's similar actually to the SSRIs, the serotonin antidepressants. Mm -hmm. They don't have an approval in Europe. It ha they have had approval in the US for a long time, but not in, in Europe, except actually for Sweden where we have one. Uh, but but uh, what do you do? I mean, you have a patient that, that needs some help, you take what's available mm -hmm. and you try it and you're allowed to do that. But of course, you know, medications have a price. And in this case, the uh, SSRIs, they are generic. They are pretty cheap today. So that's fine then. The, um, I would say the pay payer system don't, don't object. But if you have a very costly injection, a very costly injection, of course, the, the payer system will not allow it. You can always pay it yourself as a patient, of course, but... Uh, I, I certainly hope we won't end up there with, with suprenolone injections. Uh, so the best thing is that the, we are positive or someone else is, is positive or successful. Sorry, that's my word. The, the best would be that we are successful <laughs> with the development of this suprenolone injection for migraine, for example. And then they, it will be available. And it will also be available for everyone that was a research on it. That's, I think it's tremendously important. So I think that's the best hope. Do you, um, what is the time scale on that? Is there something in, in mind in when that would come to market if it was successful? Uh, I know it's how long is a piece of string. Yes, <laughs> exactly. We are in a phase 2A study, meaning that's the first time you test it in patients. If that is positive, we have to do the phase 2B study and eventually the phase 3. I, I would, my guesstimate would be that it can be on the market in 2027, 20, maybe. Okay, so about seven years. Mm. It's okay. a hard figure to understand, but uh, we have to, we have to. It is, but it has to be done right. So It has to be done right, and it is in the interest of patient safety. That's why. From a PMDD community perspective, what were the positives that came out of the research? Did we learn anything new about PMDD and the cause? And do we think anything new will come out of the additional data analysis related to PMDD? Well, uh, for us, as a pharma, sincerely hope that our work have at least helped increasing the awareness of the condition. And here you are doing a great job also, also I know. Uh, and during the recruitment of the participants, we have advertised and the responses to these ads were actually overwhelming. We had over 1.2 million clicks on the ads showing that this is really something that interests and there is a need for it. And there were, of course, also very, uh, many women that tried our screening test on the web. I also heard some was, were angry because the test was uh, seemingly too strict, but... Again, you have to remember that uh, the inclusion criteria in the study needs to be stricter always. Very so that's much so. Mm -hmm. it, yes. I, I do uh, remember seeing some angry comments yes. on there, but obviously, you know, PMDD it, it's is... It's a study. It's a study yeah. still, yes. Of course. Um, we will clearly uh, analyze the, the data because still I, I only have the sort of top line data. Uh, we will continue to do that. And I think you should know that there is a group of physicians and researchers that are continuously uh, very focused on, on PMDD 
and we will certainly share the data with them. They are uh, knocking on my door every day to say, do you have it soon? Okay, uh, that's good to know. That's that to is know. good for you to know. And, and clearly, I can't promise that we find anything we will do or we can. Um, as I said uh, before, it would be very good if we had a handle to show who is actually the one that would benefit most from the drug, but uh, they are normally called biomarkers. But today we have, we have no such biomarker uh, available. Uh, but uh, that's also something that, that uh, we really hope for the uh, research community. Yes. Help a lot. Yes, very much so. Uh, so that would mean that there was a blood test developed so that we could actually pick up those biomarkers to find pure PMDD patients. Is that correct? Exactly, for example, okay. yes. Mm. Okay. Is there any chance that in maybe in the future things will change and sopranolone will keep being developed for PMDD? Um, well, um, as I said before, um, maybe a longer treatment period would help to delineate out the difference between the pharmacological effect and the placebo effect. Well, I certainly hope so, but um, Asarina will not be able to do this, most likely. We will, as I said before, we will analyze all the data from the study, um, of course, and, and uh, we will share any information we get with, with the community of physicians and researchers that are still very um, highly focused on, on PMDD and want to help. Um, that's the best we can do right now. Uh, I think also if we can uh, manage to get sopranolone injections out to the market via maybe the menstrual migraine indication, that would also be helpful in the future because then it's sopranolone is available for, for any further research. So I think that's the, the best right now. Okay. And is that because it's um, cost prohibitive for you as a Yes, of course, we, we are dependent on financing, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and there is still a lot to do in development in terms of manufacturing. Uh, and, uh, and there again, with the negative results here, uh, the investors are not so keen on investing in that. But on the other hand, having, having then another indication as, as the menstrual migraine, and we're also working in Tourette syndrome, then, then we will have the sort of uh, scaling up of production anyway. So, so I think all that's working in the positive mood, of course. Uh, the difference is, of course, as any pharma, we cannot come out and, and claim that the use of sopranolone in this indication because we haven't done any studies. Will there possibly be a follow-up study in the future that will last longer so that there is enough time for the placebo effect to fade away? I think lots of us were very enthusiastic about sopranolone before the trials, so maybe this has contributed to the last effect, the large effect in the placebo group. I mean, certainly a longer treatment period may be helpful to delineate out what's pharmacological effect and what's a placebo effect. Um, and I, I think overall, this is a, not only for a study, but in general, I think we have, unfortunately, uh, we need to have patience when we try a new drug or even trying a new dose of a drug that you already have. Uh, it may take two to three months before you see the effect wears off of, the, of a drug and it wasn't useful for you. But the other way can also be that actually after a couple of months, you see that there, are, there is some beneficial effect of a new drug. And, and having that patient is very difficult when you're not feeling good, right? But I think it's important message to everyone to understand that uh, some, some element of patience is needed. And uh, also sometimes maybe um, a drug can sort of start off uh, and facilitate in a, getting a better coping strategy for the future. I think that's also very important. Um, and... and um, then clear in general, I mean, the fact that we are raising the awareness of one um, it's spoken about in families and friends and to get a chance to understand what it is, is also, of course, very important and will support in any treatment, even if it's 
a plaster still only, maybe not the best treatment alternative, but but I think we 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 need to use what's available right now, and that's uh, uh, and in this it's a big portion of being patient as well. I must say since 2016, I, I sort of see a dawn because as you say, much more is spoken about uh, it, with, with regard to women's health. So, so it's starting to grow, but I think it's more of a smaller or mid-sized company that would do this, not the big pharma. And okay. um, I, that is what I think. Yes. And um, just one last question, actually, I just wanted to clarify. So uh, the clinical trials lasted each phase lasted about three months. Is that correct? That that's as long as the um, in all, needed all, to take them? Yeah, in all, all studies performed, they have been three months placebo controlled studies, except one that was actually very first study in with Prozac, fluoxetine. That was a six months placebo controlled study, but it was criticized because there were so much dropouts in the placebo group in that. So when, when they came to the uh, Food and Drug Administration in the US uh, asking for approval, uh, the study was so criticized and uh, partly inconclusive due to that placebo effects. And since there have only been three month studies, uh, but remember, all those drugs were sort of add-ons. They were only drugs already proved. In our case, Sopranolone, it's endogenous, natural, yet it's not out there as a drug. And therefore, we, we don't get much waivers. We still have to make all, all the risk uh, assessments and all the studies, which is, of course, in the interest of the patient's safety, for sure. Yes. So that's important to remember. So is someone asked whether or why aren't longer clinical trials run if it has such a high placebo effect? If it was run for longer, do you think that placebo mm -hmm. effect would drop? There, there is um, actually a guideline from the European Medical Agency on PDD. It was issued in 2011 and that requests six-month placebo control study. And it has been criticized so much from from us and others because it seems like unethical to ask someone to go six months for placebo control okay quite frankly and uh, i know you have been spoken to olivia yes <laughs> she's yes, awesome. and she said never in my life i would do that on the other hand if you see it from this point of view okay now we have a huge placebo effect so maybe it's not so unethical when you think about it given of course that for those that really then where the effect wins out and and they really are suffering you need to offer something instead mm -hmm. so i think uh, we have to sort of work together with the regulatory agency and maybe see what they are willing to do and um, in analog actually going back to my own company um, you know in diabetic neuropathy uh, the end points for that was reduced amputation frequency and stuff like that. But on the other hand, there was no drugs. Everything was failures because no one could really prove such a thing. It takes many, many years. So when we came with our new drug, they said, okay, we realize uh, we can't ask that. We need to ask for something simpler. Like uh, in that case, we assessed the nerve, nerve function with uh, nerve conduction velocity and things like that. So it's called then a surrogate marker. I, I think a little bit, we'll see from the data here, but we are using this DRSP scale. It's a very elaborate scale. It asks 24 questions each day. And, okay. and the patients have been so committed and, and in their ratings as well as in taking the drug, yet I wonder if it is actually sensitive tool mm -hmm. and i know also the professor o'brien has said why should we ask so many questions what if i ask the patient what are what are your your worst pr problem is it depression is it anxiety anger irritability name one or two of them mm -hmm. for her and then we ask her to rate only those rather it could mm -hmm. be different than from each woman maybe something that would be a more sensitive uh, assessment 
And maybe that could also help in reducing a placebo effect like this because you're sort of wearing everyone out with asking all these questions. I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, so that, there are things to discuss for sure. And uh, there, again, we will share it with the QLs like Dr. Panay and uh, Dr. O'Brien and uh, the, the others. Uh, so really the ideal next step would be that um, blood test to recognize oh, the yes, biomarkers. If we, if we could, if we could, yes. Uh, but uh, that's, I think it's a long way. We have ever thought about it a lot. Everyone is, but uh, what is it? Mm. Yes. Mm. What is it? Mm. Okay, thank you so much to Karen for joining us. Really appreciate you giving us your time. This interview was recorded on Monday the 4th of May 2020 and all information is correct at time of recording. Please visit iapmd.org for further information about PMDD and other treatments available. Please visit asarinapharma.com for updates on the ongoing development of sopranolone for menstrual migraines and Tourette's syndrome. Thank you, see you again.